before I start talking, I wanted to do a quick little, very short meditation. So if you just take a moment to notice your breathing, and bring your attention to your feet. Notice the sensations. And also bring your attention to the sensation your pelvis and your sits bones are making with whatever's beneath you, chair, cushion, floor. See if you can allow yourself to rest a little bit more downward in these points of support. You may even sense and feel the earth holding you. See if you can let your energy settle downward. I want to ask you a question. Take note of whatever arises, especially the first thing that arises, whether it makes sense or not. Why are you practicing? Once again, you can let this question go. Feel the, those contact points, those support points in your feet, your pelvic floor. Notice your breathing. What are you practicing for? Okay, you can shift out of this. Later, when we go into groups, you might share a little bit about what came up. But I wanted to ask you all, in some form or fashion, what you're seeking before I say anything. I quite like questions like that to see what arises organically in our embodied experience, especially if we can find it before we start having additional concepts and narratives overlay on that immediate response of why we practice, why we show up, why we're here at this retreat. And given that we're all at this retreat right now, I assume there's a significant amount of seeking already present. We found our way here. But it can be really helpful to explicitly talk about what we're seeking and why we're seeking if we have clarity around that, we can deepen our commitment to what we're seeking. We can help guide ourselves and each other to more and more appropriate forms and responses in our practice, in our efforting. And, you know, when I thought about this talk, because we're here again and we're excited, almost what needs to be said we're here, let's get on with the efforting. And that's what we're doing in this retreat. But this is an opportunity today to slow down a little bit and to wonder creatively, openly about why we're here and to ask that question over and over again. In exploring this, uh, there are three questions that came up for me about seeking. How does the seeking phase emerge? What does the seeking phase look like in practice? And what does the seeking phase look like in our life? So as far as the seeking phase emerging, really it could arise from any number of causes and conditions. Sometimes uh, 
different ways of summarizing for me are something is not right or something is possible. We get that sense. Something isn't right. Something could, could come to be. And we start sensing that palpably, even if we can't label it or articulate it fully. It's the first spark. And in the seeking phase, we go to clarify that more and more. So that way we can put some effort behind it. It could be a radical event in our life. I mean, this year, I think we've, we keep having one after another that could easily spark so much seeking of change. And sometimes maybe it's a culmination of experiences in our life that add up to a tipping point, whether small or large, that motivate us to seek something, to seek change. Suffering is often a motivation. We experience suffering in ourselves, collectively, individually, families, communities, the world. And we say we have to do something. This has to change. That's the feeling that comes up first. But of course, possibility, creative possibility can arise too. We sense something beautiful and new can arise and emerge in our life. And that's a motivation for us. So one way or another, a spark is lit. And again, I think it's really helpful for all of us to personally, individually, collectively identify and talk about that. I think it helps to, to deepen the roots that unfold in our efforts later. We know why we're showing up. We know why we're doing this. And out of the seeking often a reorientation will emerge. So the seeking is the fuel, it's the fire. And out of that, we start thinking, okay, how do I want to practice? How do I want to shape my life? What's next? And we could be doing that a lot together today too, in this retreat, and all week long. Maybe we are reorienting right now by participating in this retreat. For me, uh, I would also say this seeking phase happened, has happened multiple times in my life. It doesn't seem like it will ever end, the, the cycle of the phases of insight. And my first experience of this was about 20 years ago, and it was just a result of my own personal experience of deep depression, anxiety, and randomness, or maybe karma, depending on how you like to see these things. But I saw a book of the, the Dalai Lamas in my bookstore in small city, Missouri where I wasn't surrounded by anybody who was doing these kinds of things. And I saw it and I saw a possibility. I picked the book up, I read it and saw some sense of relief or potential relief in my life to do something different. And there was no rhyme or reason to it at that time. It was just, I followed an intuition. I picked up that book and I read and out of that blossomed a lot of effort. Whereas right now, my seeking is much more collectively oriented response oriented of saying what are we doing here you know why are we practicing not just why am i practicing and so much is happening so fast that i feel like um i we maybe are in the midst of a great seeking and hopefully a great effort so oh another I wanted to share this too. The, uh, a common motivation in the tradition of Buddhism is uh, to practice like your hair is on fire. This is a common phrase. And they're trying to motivate externally, motivate you to, to wake up, to practice. So don't dilly-dally, don't be lazy, show up on the cushion, do the, do the practice. I thought too that also the motivation could be practice as if the world is on fire these days because I feel it feels like that I think to a lot of us so sometimes we look and lean on external motivation the seeking phase of guidance of I feel something but I really don't know how to maintain it or how to to cultivate this emergent seeking so we can use that practice as if your hair's on fire practice as if the world is on fire essentially practice as if this really is important and it matters but again I still am passionate to say that we all need to really organically um, identify and clarify why what what about the world's on fire and what way is the world on fire 
how do we imagine it to be different in the future? What will it take to make these changes? How does that relate to our practice? So how does this seeking phase look like and what does it look like in practice? Well, um, for sure, I've noticed commonly there's a lot of excitement. At first, when it emerges, there might be a lot of confusion, uncertainty, and pain. But once we start, we, we find a little something to, to gnaw on, to, to grab onto, there's the sense of possibility that even if there's a lot of pain and suffering, I might be able to do something. We might be able to do something about that. And so excitement emerges, and, uh, which will later then support our efforts. We have the questions of what should I practice? How should I practice? And today we have so many options. In the past, this was often prescribed. You found a collection of practices, a collection of practices, a collection of views that say, really, this is how you should seek and why you should seek, and then these are the practices you should do. But today we have access to a lot of different traditions, lots of ways of meditating, a lot of ways of practicing individually and collectively. So I think maybe that question can arise even more. What should I practice out of this, you know, uh, myriad of world of, of, of practices and applications and programs and things like that? And when it comes to the efforting phase, it, it, it's important to clarify that in the seeking phase of where should I orient right now so that way I can apply effort. Otherwise, my effort might fizzle out or it may not bear fruit. And that'll be important if we've really identified why we're seeking. We want to identify that because it matters. And so sometimes if we find difficulty in our efforting, we may, not, we may need to return back to what we're seeking, why we're doing this. And then that will easily then propel, I would say, the efforting. So if you're fired up about your practice now, about you have some fire in your seeking, I encourage you to spend some time clarifying that. And if you're unclear um, in terms of exactly what you're seeking, again, you can spend time like we did in the embodied inquiry. You can spend time connecting with each other in these groups today, hearing what, what's motivating other people. You might find something in common with all of us here in, in clarifying why you're practicing. Also, sampling practices and traditions can be very helpful too. You know, much like I just saw it, came across the book in a bookstore, it sparked something that then became organic and embodied for me. So you can do that in the seeking phase as well um, to uh, experiment until something calls to you. And then again, when, when a book or a practice or a tradition calls to you, spend time asking why. Why is this calling to me? What about this is important to me? What is this serving for me and us? Some common practices in the seeking phase are concentration, which we started doing in this, in this first 24 hours. Um, because we're trying to gather our attention, we're trying to prep ourselves for great effort. So concentration is important. Clearing obstacles, various practices that are geared around clearing obstacles in ourselves and in life so that way we have a clearer path for efforting and more energy to apply in efforting so you'll see a lot of variations of of this um, but concentration is probably one of the most common in the seeking phase and what does this seeking phase look like in life well first of all again obviously we're connecting this to why we're practicing in the first place but also we start to notice the tensions and the differences between how we imagine life could be and how it is right now. And also how we imagine ourselves putting out effort and also in what ways we maybe get in, in, in our own way to where maybe we identify a practice and say, yes, concentration would be good to cultivate, to support uh, these meaningful changes, but then I have difficulty maintaining that practice or getting it going. So we start noticing, and that is a practice, just simply noticing the divergence and the difference between our hopes and aspirations and how it is right now. How does that feel? How can we work with those differences with patience and compassion, hopefully for ourselves? Uh, we'll definitely come against habitual patterns. Um, 
that uh, get in the way of that seeking, that distract us from practicing, um, from distracting us from what matters most. That's a really important to always tie that to what matters most. It can be one thing that we might do here is adopt ethical guidelines or adopt certain structures in our life. For example, we say, I will meditate every day for 30 minutes at this time. And we say, I'm going to stick with that structure because right now I need to gather my energy and gather my attention. And if I don't have that structure, it sort of falls apart. And I, and and the efforting to support what matters most doesn't arise. So it's common in seeking phases to adopt structure, much like we're doing here in this retreat. This is a big example of that. We're saying we're going to be practicing at these times every day this much. We're uh, adopting guidelines of, of behavior and how we interact with each other and how we interact in our daily life. And those structures are very supportive in the seeking phase. In later phases, we might completely go the other way and just we have to work with letting that go. We might have attachment to that. Um, it becomes an obstacle to be fully organically, spontaneously present in life. But in the seeking phase, it can be incredibly supportive. And for me, again, this was 20 years ago, but my seeking phase, um, I, I went full Buddhist pretty, pretty much. And uh, I, I wore the same clothes every day. I was a distraction. I was just white t-shirt, brown khaki pants. I was shaving my head. And this was in the midst of college. I wasn't like in a monastery or anything, anything like that. And I did certain things like not drinking for a long time. I, I was very... Uh, yeah, as much as I could be a monk in the daily life, I was doing that for quite a while. But then after five years or so of that, I realized that that was an obstacle for me. But at the time, it was really supportive because I was in an environment where it wasn't like it. It always cracks me up to think about the difference between 20 years ago and now. Now it's like there's meditation apps everywhere. You can find community online. But in St. Joseph, Missouri, I was the only person basically I knew who was interested in any of this kind of stuff. And so I really had to put a lot of effort into establishing a lifestyle. So that way it would support my practice, especially in dorm rooms with other people around 20 years old. <laughs> so at the time it felt very appropriate. Whereas right now I would, I just doesn't interest me to do what I did then, but it was helpful for me personally. So as we move into the, the group discussion, Really, I, I support and encourage any sort of organic discussion that comes up as a result of what we're exploring here. But the main questions for me are, why am I, you, we, practicing? And I want to include, emphasize all these, I, you, we, okay? Um, what is most important to us? What's so most important to you? What do we imagine could be different? These are three open questions that we can explore to find our way into clarifying our seeking to deepening, deepening our seeking to support that efforting phase. I have a quote that I want to share with you, but a big part of me wanted to not share any quotes simply to allow the most possibility of openness for you to explore for yourself what matters rather than any external uh, quote saying, here is what you should be seeking. But I really love this quote, and this is from Jack Kornfield. Um, all other spiritual teachings are in vain if we cannot love. Even the most exalted states and the most exceptional spiritual accomplishments are unimportant if we cannot be happy in the most basic and ordinary ways. If with our hearts we cannot touch one another and the life we have been given, what matters is how we live. This is why it is so difficult and so important to ask the question of ourselves. Am I living my path fully? Do I live without regret? So that way, so that we can, on whatever day is the end of our life, we can say, yes, I have lived my path with heart. And the reason why I like this quote is I like that it points to a question. Am I living my path fully? Am I living life fully? Do I have regrets? Because we have opportunities to, to make change right now. So that's what I have to share in, in this talk for the phase of seeking. <laughs>